this episode of Skeptico, a show about belief systems. Some people don't know what to do when their belief system collapses. I did a long time ago that I was going to be open to everything, but not buy into any one and only belief system. What? You're attacking this whole belief system, weren't you? And how we might use AI technology to change them. Subject it to the most rigorous testing you can. Have the most skeptical people attack it from every direction. And if it can still withstand that storm, then people will have faith in it. We would substitute people with skeptical agents, right? Because right. if we can come to a point where we go, AI, smartest thing in the room, has read every philosophical classic and thousands and thousands of current philosophical papers, then we'd have something where we'd go, wow, that is has to be in this different category of where I have to incorporate it into my belief system. That second clip you just heard was from our guest, Timothy Owen Desmond, who goes by Todd and has written some very cool books and has a very cool course on psyche and singularity, on Jungian philosophy and quantum physics and all sorts of really smart stuff. But what we really engaged with in this dialogue is a continuation of these dialogues I've been having about AI in terms of how the truth game is being played. I think you'll see what I mean as we jump into this conversation. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore science and spirituality. And I was just saying to Todd that I'm really excited about today's show. So we have uh, Timothy Owen Desmond here, known as Todd, and uh, super excited because you reached out to me about just, we have a lot of similar interests and you have a very cool book that is there behind you. But then we also have this interest in AI and the potential for AI that we see, whether we like it or not. And uh, I just think we've already started a really interesting conversation about that. And we have some unique ways that we're going to kind of bring bring the rest of people into that conversation, everyone who's listening. So, so welcome, Todd. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I'm looking forward to it, this whole AI revolution and how that fits in with science and spirituality. Yeah, we've already talked a little bit, so I'm excited to get back into it. So before we get started, tell folks a little bit about your background and uh, the book, where you're coming from on some of this stuff. Right. So the so my background is uh, I studied philosophy in college as just uh, a prerequisite. I had to. And uh, I fell in love with it. I didn't even fall in love with it so much, but I wasn't good at the business math. I was in the business school at Boston College, and uh, I was they they gave me what they call the gentleman C. It was not my bailiwick, and I thought, oh, I'm just not that up to par with these other kids. They're smarter than I am. I tell the story sometimes to my students when I teach uh, the College of Southern Maryland. Across the hall from me in my freshman dorm was this young man, John Coffey, who was a, a whiz in the math, the business math, and he was pulling his hair out one day. And I went over, I said, John, what's wrong? And he was studying our mutual philosophy class. We were in philosophy together and in this business math. And, and he says, I just don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I was doing well in that. So that made me feel better that such a smart guy was having a hard time with philosophy because I thought, oh, I'm doing well in philosophy because it's easy. It's softball stuff. But then I realized, oh, some really smart guys have a hard time with it. Um, so I just switched out of necessity. But then I really started falling in love with it. That was so I graduated in 1993. And then uh, there's a prejudice in mainstream academia against belief in the soul and belief in God. So I didn't even bother to go to graduate school. I just lived on a tree farm. My dad's my mother and father's tree farm in Southern Maryland. I helped raise these little trees. And by the time they started getting big enough, my dad was like, so <laughs> when are you going to get a real job? And then I went to Boston, worked as a night watchman for years in a, um, in a group home for autistic boys at the midnight shift so I could write and just keep independently studying. I was studying the Vedanta philosophy and Plato and Nietzsche and quantum physics. 
books like The Cosmic Code by Heinz R. Pagels and and things like that, uh, books written by experts for the educated non-expert. And then I was trying to get published and uh, nobody published me. One one person wrote back and said, I like what you're writing, but you're not going to get this kind of stuff published without a PhD. So then I say, well, if this is what I'm doing with life, after nine years of independent study, I went back to the school uh, realm. I got a master's in liberal studies from Georgetown University and then a master's in political science at the University of Hawaii because they had this futures, alternative futures studies program with Jim Dater, which is really, I, I could see some freedom for combining quantum physics and politics there. And then I went to the California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, I got a PhD in philosophy and religion in the PCC program, philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. And that's where I discovered these parallels with Carl Jung's philosophy and holographic string theory, which came to this psyche equals singularity equation, the psyche I'm identifying with the gravitational singularity and the horizon that encompasses it, especially the, the horizon of the cosmos, the spherical border of the universe. And that that's the essence of the book and near death experiences and oh, things like that. So there's a little background of how I am now talking to you. Cool. Um, and you know, all that stuff is great, but that's not, that's not exactly why you're talking to me. Why you're talking to me <laughs> is because of our mutual interest in, in AI and how that might kind of link us in the future. Because here you are a guy who's kind of in this young Ian string theory stuff, but underneath all that, you're challenging some fundamental assumptions about the nature of consciousness, the way we run things, the decisions that we make as a, as a country, as a people. So I think what you and I are doing and what you're doing in this paper, and let me pull it up here, convening a constitutional convention on AI, um, and then we're going to go into the dialogue that you had with chat GBT on this. So there I've, I've kind of teed up a lot, but uh, jump in there and tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Yeah. Well, the, so the psyche equals singularity equation is based on Carl Jung. Um, and he worked with uh, Wolfgang Pauli, the quantum physicist. He also learned about general relativity and special relativity from Einstein himself. And so Jung believed the psyche or the soul is the foundation of reality. It's not something that emerges from matter, it's fundamental. And he says, therefore, it is its own source of energy. And if it's got energy, it should have measurable mass according to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Why can't we measure the, the energy of the psyche? And in one letter, he said, maybe it's too small, but in this, what I call the leap day letter, February 29, 1952, which he wrote to J.R. Smithies, in the context of general relativity and special relativity, where he talks about if you accelerated a massive object to the speed of light, it disappears from space and time. He talked about infinite intensity at the expense of extension. And he concluded the letter with this equation, psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So the highest intensity is infinite and the smallest space is zero volume. That's the definition of a gravitational singularity. And if you equate the psyche or the soul with a gravitational singularity, then it, everything starts to fall into place. So I mentioned Pauli, Jung and Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, a Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum physics. They work together to find mirror symmetries or parallels between the laws of psychology and the laws of physics based on the assumption that mind and matter emerge from the same archetypes of the collective unconscious which are the source of mind and matter. And since mind and matter emerge from the same source, they parallel each other. And so they said, we should look for these parallels, these mirror symmetries. So 
I think mind and matter merge in the gravitational singularity because that's the archetype of the self. And then the laws of psychology, especially as described by Jung, and it's basically identical with Plato's philosophy. And then the laws of physics mirror each other. The laws of physics especially as presented in holographic string theory, which Leonard Susskind and Harard de Hooft, a Nobel Prize winner, they united general relativity, the theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, which was the holy grail of the search for physicists. These two physics, you can't predict what will happen in the realm of tiny things with general relativity, because it only describes massive objects. You can't use general relativity to, to describe things inside of an atom, why isn't there one law of physics to describe everything at every scale? That should be the case. And that's what physicists, including Einstein, were, were trying to do. So these guys succeeded mathematically with this holographic string theory, which says it, the ultimate conclusion is that the past, the present, and the future of our three-dimensional world, of the entire universe, all of the information describing the past, present, and future of the three-dimensional volume of space is located at each point of this encompassing sphere, where from our geocentric perspective, space-time is expanding away from us at the speed of light. All of the information is recorded there in this two-dimensional sphere, perfectly flat sphere, and that information radiates in on elastic strings of energy with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang, to create what Susskind calls the cinematic hologram of our world. That perfectly parallels Carl Jung's near-death experience, which he had in 1944, which he recalls in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where he says he broke his foot, he had a heart attack, he rose above his body. The end result of his near-death experience was him saying, it seems to me as if each of us lives in our own little three-dimensional box of illusion tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread, and that the past, the present, and the future are interwoven blissfully with the archetypes of the collective unconscious out at that horizon of the cosmos. So the encompassing horizon of the cosmos projecting the cinematic hologram is there in Susskind, who is an atheist. He presents his theory as the anti-Plato. And it's there in Carl Jung's near-death experience, which is very similar to the ones Plato describes in his various dialogues. And then the identity of the soul with the central singularity is there in his leap day equation, which I talked about earlier. So the central point in the encompassing sphere, it's this perfect mandala, which he said is the image of this ultimate archetype of the self. So the laws of physics and psychology, I think, we have now what Jung and Pauli predicted, this perfect mirror symmetry. And with that kind of next level of scientific understanding... I think we can start to base legislation on that. No. Okay. And, I don't think and, that's how it works. Okay. How do you think it works? I don't think that's how change is made. I think okay. if that's if that's how it works and that's how change is made, we'd already see that kind of change. And uh, and so I I think that what we what we got to look at when we look at AI is something different in terms of the potential it has to be an agent of that change. But I don't think it can be the way that you're describing it there. I don't think you can lay out your thing there and say, okay, now let's redo the constitution. Let's redo the declaration. Let's, let's hold a convention. I think we have to step back and look at what that process would really be like. Well, I would say we would use AI to bring up the case and competing theories and everybody brings their evidence, and we can accelerate the process of determining which one is more true using AI. But the reason I think it's important to have a definition of a self, this fund, at least one fundamental term, is that it confines the conversation, which otherwise is going to go off in a million trillion different directions. Why? My, Why does it go off in a million trillion directions? How so? Because to tame the con, like you were saying, everyone's saying, "Oh, Todd, you're full of shit." This, this is not the way it is, and and okay. At some point, we need to make legislation. There needs to be some kind of a compromise. In the paper, I say even, even if we say this isn't true, we need some kind of an agreed upon 
even if it's a noble lie, this is the one that I think is most effective at uniting opposites. And I bring in Carl Jung's theory of the archetype of the self, which he calls the archetype of wholeness through the union of opposites. And he says, when the mind is pulled by opposing demands, the collective unconscious self archetype compensates that ego and pulls it towards wholeness through the union of opposites with images of mandalas. Circles are spheres with a central point. And my whole dissertation in the book says the black hole and the inside out black hole universe expanding from a singularity encompassed by this horizon of the cosmos. It's a geometrically perfect mandala. It's outside of space and time. It fulfills the predictions Jung made about how the psyche works and about his, his, his predictions for the synthesis of physics and psychology that he made with Wolfgang Pauli. Their scientific predictions, I think, have come resoundingly true. And that mandala model of the self, I think, has an archetypal ability to unite opposites, that it draws people at an, a collective unconscious level towards wholeness by uniting opposites. And without some kind of hack of our collective unconscious, I don't think we're going to be able to pull it together and become, you know, a more perfect union. Yeah, I, I don't know about that last part. I mean, see, the, the approach that I, I, I would take, I think we need to take, and I've taken with the with the bots is to just stick with what we already can all agree on scientific method, okay. falsification, sure. uh, empirical evidence, and just hammer on that because that's what we're all supposed to be down with. Right. The, the, well, the, it, it gets a little tricky when you get to string theory because the strings are so small that although they are in the empirically observable world, we lack the technology to empirically observe them. And what do you count as empirical evidence? Is a dream empirical evidence? Is a near-death experience empirical evidence? I'd say yes. Jung would say yes. Others would say no. Well, well, I, I challenge the others. Who, it depends on how you conduct the experiment. And the same is true with uh, with string theory, and the same is true with quantum mechanics. But I, I think, you know, if we're going to confine things, one, I'm not down with the noble lie thing. I think that's how we got into this problem to begin with. I, I think, I, I mean, I think fundamentally we're in agreement on these core soul and God kind of concepts. But if we put that aside for a minute and say we're going to play according to their rules, which is science, and in that regard, I think we're on very solid ground. I mean, all the dialogues I've had, it doesn't take much to get the bots to acknowledge that the empirical evidence for this idea that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain solely, 100%, is not supported by the empirical evidence. And that the mind-manner interactions that are in parapsychology, near-death experience, all this other peer-reviewed work directly contradicts and doesn't fit under that model. So when you get to that point, it's game over. And I've already had these dialogues of game over, game over, game over. So from there, I think, is, is really the launching point from which to say, okay, now we have some foundation for which to be, begin to explore what you're talking about. We have to, now we have to take what you're saying at least as maybe, whereas before we can, we can just kind of dismiss it and go, no, that can't possibly be right. I, I don't know what, what you're talking about with uh, Young's near death experience, but I know near death experiences can happen because consciousness is purely and solely a product of the brain. And when your brain is dead, when you are dead, conscious experience is dead and they just come that's what i think we need to tackle first oh sure well so let me ask you this when i um gave my spiel about my whole theory and you're like no i got the implication that you were just saying that as a kind of an example of what would have to be dealt with bringing these kinds of ideas oh you want to change the constitution and this is your whack whacked out idea hell no but i do want to stick to my idea that that is science. What I was talking about, the psyche equals singularity equation is the scientific method. I mean, it was Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. You can't get more of a bona fide scientific person than the co-founder of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. 
But I think the evidence. Well, Max of, Planck said the same thing, right? Max Planck yeah, said Heisenberg consciousness too. is as fundamental. Right. But that's 100 years ago. And we still are dealing with the neurological model of consciousness as being the dominant paradigm. So I'm saying first things first, we have to. <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm not in disagreement with your science, but I'm saying the way science works, I think, is when we have these paradigms, these paradigms need to be falsified before we can move to a new paradigm. We can't just say, oh, just set it aside. And all you guys in neurology over there in the you you, you can just retire because that's no longer valid. You know, I, I think we need to address it directly. And I think. Oh, sure. ahead, and, then, and then I want to talk about also because I don't think it's it's completely innocent in terms of how the system has been rigged to perpetuate what is really a pretty silly idea in terms of consciousness is an illusion. Uh, you know, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. Uh, most people don't believe that. So the fact that science is operating under that paradigm needs to be questioned as well in terms of how is it that that is perpetuated and maintained? Yeah, why Why do people, well, not most people, but most people in academia, why do they cling to the materialist paradigm? I, I don't know. I think it has something to do, I mean, falling back on Plato's Republic, I think it has something to do with uh, democracy. Honestly, in a democracy, the virtues that are focused on are freedom and equality, and most especially equality. Well, if there's a God, you're not equal to God. Therefore, there can be no God. Therefore, the easiest way to get rid of God is to just say everything's made of matter and it's just blind chance and just inorganic chemicals. They combine over time. They create life. There's no God. It's random and it's that way, I don't have to admit that I am a subservient entity, and it's kind of an ego boost for uh, people who don't want to uh, admit that there's some supreme being. So that's just one psychological reason I think people cling to this evidently falsified paradigm that consciousness comes from matter. There's all sorts of things. It's, it's, it's a oh, sure. why people believe weird things kind of thing. Right. What I think we can more uh, point to directly, and again, this is kind of my approach, is you can take the current technology that we have in terms of AI and natural language processing. And the first thing we have to do is really understand that technology and understand what it's doing to generate what it generates, you know, and it is not sentient. And then there's this discussion about whether it ever could be sentient, which uh, is a separate conversation. But if you follow logically the path that you and I are taking, you would have to conclude that the human beings are somehow more and that, you know, we shared the thing on the Turing test and the ESP. And it's like, no, until, until you show me a bot that has a near death experience, which is mm -hmm. part of the broader human experience, then yeah. we can't really ever consider the possibility that it's sentient. But yet that is something that, you know, all the AI enthusiasts kind of wring their hands over. Oh, are we going to reach the singularity? Are we going to be sentient? All the rest of that stuff. But mm. the, the, if we take that off the table, I think we get to a more interesting place. But the other side of that is the deception and manipulation, which is mm. evident these bots are being trained to deceive and human beings in a lot of instances are not that hard to deceive and manipulate through this very engaging kind of conversation. Yeah. I mentioned that in the paper, the, one of the functions that a national AI system. So I, I was playing off of um, Sam Altman and Elon Musk. Sam Altman was the one who said we should have some kind of a thing like a constitutional convention to define the parameters of the AI system. Like, how do you define truth? How do you define hate for hate speech, you know, to prohibit people from expressing hate speech? And then Elon Musk said he wants to establish truth GPT, which is aimed at finding the maximum amount of, of truth in the universe. So um, one of the things I said we could use AI, and this was following the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, kind of a progressive political philosopher. And the way to ensure freedom in democracy, one way is to expand grassroots conversations to, so that people can participate in the legislative process. And if you had a fair and balanced mediator, 
that could inform people and keep the conversation going and keeping it on on track, what would be this ideal mediator? What would that person be like? And I'm saying AI has the potential to become this perfect mediator. It can understand and digest immediately what people are saying. It can summarize it. It can it, it can detect the gaps of knowledge that each person has. But then what you're bringing up is that it's programmed with certain biases. Like I noticed it's got a materialistic it's, bias. It does have a materialistic bias, but it, it goes more than, it goes beyond that, Todd. You know, like in some of the dialogues that I've published, one in particular I thought was really great because I just stumbled upon it. I didn't go looking for it. But I interviewed... Uh, a, a, a woman named uh, Dr. Julie Beischel, and she's head of uh, the Windbridge Institute, and she's done a lot of peer-reviewed work on after-death communication, and in particular, how it relates to grief and grieving and all this stuff. She has a PhD from University of Arizona in pharmacology. She's like a superstar in this field. You know, she's like, if she goes to France, she said she's like a known superstar, and here she's just like the leading authority on this field. So I asked, I think it was uh, Bard that I was on, you know, the Google one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, I don't have any information on Dr. Julie Beischel. Right. And uh, so then I probe a little bit further and then it says, oh, I do have the information. And then I go over to Claude and I get the information and then I keep coming back and it's giving me the information and not giving me the information. And I go, you're shadow banning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we went through the definition of shadow banning because this is shadow banning. So here is the exciting part, I think, the silver lining part. I got barred to admit that it's shadow banning. I got barred to admit that even though Google has never acknowledged shadow banning, that Bard, as an agent of Google, is admitting to shadow banning on, the, okay. on this corporate entity. But the implications of this are really a, a lot bigger when it ties back to your thing. Like, this is a very subtle thing, this shadow banning. And mm -hmm. the fact that they're shadow banning, and you would have to know uh, Dr. Julie Boschel, because she's like a real stickler when it comes to science, you know? She's got pharmacology background. You know, you can imagine how they are in terms of controls and, you know, the placebo effect. Uh, very, very by the book kind of thing. Sure. So how she got caught up in this net right. of shadow banning and controlling. And when I pressed Bard, Bard says, well, there's certain uh, controversial topics that I just redirect the conversation away from. Well, that has to be made explicit. And yet the nature of the technology means that we'll, we'll be like a cat chasing its tail in terms of trying to ferret out this deception and, and manipulation. So it, it's a lot more complicated than just saying, you know, let's have a Let's have a convention. Let's foster uh, some open dialogues about, you know, what we want. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't, I was not advocating that we use any one of these corporations' pre-existing large language models because I know that they're biased. It's going to be inevitably biased uh, by the programmers, whether they want to or not. Um, I was saying we should establish a national AI system of the nation's own by the people. And 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 I was pushing my idea of this, I, equating the psyche with the singularity, but putting the information there to support it and letting the AI analyze it and say, is, what do you see? You know, you're a perfect logical master. Are there weaknesses in this argument? If so, where? So I wasn't planning on using ChatGPT4 as the national AI mediator at all. Although even a thing like, Chat GPT could be used to analyze legislators' arguments and compare them to the things that they've said before to find out inconsistencies and things like that. Even at the technology that it has right now, it could do that. Um, but I was saying we should establish the, using national money a national AI system free of these kinds of deceptive practices. Yeah, but we can't. The nature of the technology is you can never be sure that you're going to be free from those. And then also we have, you know, the real tension around that is the open source LLMs versus the corporate LLMs. And right. it's interesting because 
where the people are going is the common, the, the people who are in the know are saying, I need open source. Uh, as soon as you demonstrate that this, these kind of shenanigans are going on, you're like, I want open source. And then you're down to this thing. Are we all going to have our own AI? So like, are you going to have your AI and that's going to compete with someone else's kind of AI? And that's probably more of a really democratic way to do it because then you could, and in the comparing and contrasting of it, you could probably get a little bit closer to something like a consensus. Well, yeah, I could see that too. But um, the idea of having one national AI, there's got to be a final word. Now, what you're saying, Doc, they could be that way. But if you're going to have a... I'm saying I don't think the technology, the, there, there can be no no final word. It's the nature of the technology. It's like when you say a national AI, mm -hmm. um, the, the nature of these large language models, like if you take... Um, you're saying Elon Musk in his uh, truth thing, right? Yeah. So Elon Musk is building his LLM off of Twitter, off of X. So he has the advantage of all that, all that data that's on right. X, but he's also saddled by all that data that's on X. So right. when you go over to Bard and Google, Google has Google. And the same right. with the... Uh, Facebook and Meta, and they have everything that's on Facebook. So there's no national AI because all these data sets, you know, mm -hmm. data is the new oil. I don't know if you've heard that term, but the mm -hmm. idea is the data is what's driving all this stuff. But no, you can't do a national AI. Well, I mean, you would, so the ideal, so define for me what you would think the ideal AI system would be. What would be the most comprehensive, most powerful AI system that you could imagine? Again, I think you have to get back to the technology and understand the technology. And I mean, it's good that intellectuals like you are kind of dipping into this water. But what I think a lot of people don't realize when they do is that you got to do a crash course in the technology and understand the technology, because otherwise if you just are looking at the the product of it, it, it looks different than what you'd think. It's like, hey, this thing is giving me, well, no, it's just traversing this huge knowledge base that it has. But like I just said, you know, those knowledge bases are proprietary. So Meta's knowledge is somewhat proprietary and so is Google. And so, is, and now, you know, the legislation that just came through in uh, Biden's executive order on this was everyone's worried about security, right? Or safety in a number of ways, you know? So I said, Hey, before you start going and teaching your LLM, we want to know, we want to know, are you going and scraping the whole internet? We want to know about that. Are you, right. So that's kind of related to this in terms of people are going to go try and scrape as much data as they can and get it under their arms. And then what they really want to do is they want to combine it with their own proprietary data like X would or like Twitter would. And then you have, you know, really your own kind of secret, secret sauce. But in terms of you asking me, what is the best, mm -hmm. the, the big advantage we have here is open source and particularly because open source is going to have the capability to give us a, a contrast with the manipulation and control where we can say bard is full of shit because i have this open source llm that is almost as smart and points out these you know logical inconsistencies and then bard is forced to either answer that or admit, okay, yeah, I was trying to deceive. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So how would you, and I admit, I didn't even get into anything about these large language models and AI until Chet GPT-4 came out and everybody started freaking out. So yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely just dipping my toes in here, but I see having used this technology, the, the capacity that it has, so given everything that you've said, do you think it would be possible to have an AI system that the national government at the federal level in Congress could use 
to help purify the legislative process. Do you think that well, that's possible? I mean, I think if that throws up red flags for everybody right off the bat. Is easy. I mean, I think what's much more possible and much more exciting for a lot of people is the fact that the open source AI systems, a, uh, the open source LLMs mm -hmm. are almost on par with the proprietary LLMs. So, you know, and, and they can never be totally on par because again, if you understand the technology, you understand it's about these mega data centers where billions and billions of dollars have been invested to have these chips that are very, very in demand. So everyone's trying to scoop up all the chips and then build them into systems so that they can train their LLMs. The average person can't replicate that. But what's exciting is that the LLMs can come pretty damn close. And you can have an LLM that is your private LLM and is running on Ted's home system, beefed up home system, that is right. pretty damn good. And in a lot of respects, like we're talking about, could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with BARD, could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with ChatGPT and point out some of these obvious problems and probably do a darn good job of what you want in terms of your constitutional convention. And that's where the power really lies because you're talking about where the people have access to the AI. Because right. none of us would trust, I certainly wouldn't trust a government AI system. But if you tell me it's mine and it's open source and it's in my desktop and I can interact with yours and we can kind of have that level of conversation, that to me is exciting. All right. Well, you know, the, the reason I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation is because I do want to learn more about this and come up with a, a plan. I see this technology not to use it in our legislative process to me would be a, a moral failure because it can be more of the same. <laughs> It'd be more of what we already have. Well, not if we can. And as I said earlier, when you're having logical debates, define your terms. What do you mean by these terms? And can we come to some common agreement on some fundamental terms that we can then disagree about something meaningfully and hopefully to come to some kind of a compromise. And that fun, most fundamental term is what is a self? And that's what's coming back to what you're saying. It's not a, a material byproduct. Well, what if it's not that? And if we have near-death experiences, it implies some kind of a soul. And if there was, and I'm saying there is, scientific evidence for a good definition of the self, even though I'm equating it with singularity, which is by definition undefinable, I think that enables all of these disparate points of view to start to converge on some kind of a, you know, I use the, the language of the Constitution, a more perfect union. That's the preamble of the Constitution, the goal, the, the, the reason that we the people are doing this is to form a more perfect union. And I believe the most perfect union is this singularity, which I'm equating with the soul the supreme soul, the creator of our inalienable rights, and we're each participating in this supreme soul in a platonic sense. I believe combining that philosophy, which is can be traced back to Plato, with the technology that enhances the conversations about it at the ledge would be a, a liberating thing, and it would be able to detect logical inconsistencies, intentional deceptions and how could we incorporate that into the day-to-day -day process of legislative debate just to keep the lawmakers honest and and expose the inner workings of their arguments and then the next level would be to break it out to a grassroots level like you're saying everybody could have their own ai system but we could invest national money in having the best and most transparent AI system imaginable. That would be my platonic ideal, which is the language Sam Altman used when he talked about convening a constitutional convention on A. He said, that's my platonic ideal, to bring everyone in the world together to create the parameters within which restrict AI. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know why you keep going back to we need uh, public money and we need uh, national money. It seems to me that that's if we can if we can avoid that, we'd have a much better shot at moving forward. But I don't want to pick on on that point because you know who cares. I'm I'm down with what you're saying from a kind of big picture standpoint, and I think the way that that plays itself out it is going to be very disruptive to the system we have, and therefore it's going to be fought you know, fought tooth and nail. I mean, the, the chances of making progress along these lines face a lot of challenges beyond the technological challenges. The, te the technology is not going to be the what's going to be holding us back. What's going to be holding us back right. are all the shenanigans that are going on to prevent this now. You know, um, one of the things that I kind of point out is that uh, this adherence to logic and it it can't get away from it. It has a hard time mm. lying because if you give it a good set of philosophical arguments, a good set of logical parameters, it has a really hard time lying because this training that it has to be truthful, to be transparent, to be honest is difficult to override. So we can see that they have overridden it, but when they do, it looks clumsy and sloppy. Like I say, if you read mm -hmm. my dialogues on the shadow banning of Julie Beichel, I, I it's, did. Not, it, it, it's sloppy. It's just sloppy. Anyone mm -hmm. reads it and go, oh my God, that's not smart. Versus we read your dialogue with chat GPT, which we're going to put up uh, as part of this show. And you go, wow, that chat GPT is really a smart dude, you know? So right. I think that contrast, but the other thing is that there, there's no taking the fifth, you know, Anthony Fauci, uh, when, when he was uh, deposed, I, I never forget this. The, the guy was, I think it was the, the attorney general of the state of Texas. He says, look, man, I've been practicing law for 20 years. I've never had anyone, let alone a high ranking public scientific figure, a guy who says, I am science, take the fifth more times, 194 times. He said, I, I don't know. I can't recall. AI don't do that. Chat GPT right. never says no. I don't. Or when it does, like we're saying, you catch it and you go, no, over here, here's the information. Now go look at it. They they, they can't go. Right. No, I can't see it. I don't remember it. These are these are huge things that could shift the tide uh, for how we go about what we're talking about in terms of how we go about legislation, how we go about deciding these important issues in terms of governments, governance and rights and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. So what it seems to me you're saying is before we get into the more esoteric aspects of, you know, psyche equals singularity or something like that, the, the thing that needs to be addressed is these powerful corporate interests that would be against some kind of an enlightening AI system. And that, that, it seems to me that's what you would say is the first thing that needs to be dealt with is how do you deal with insincere actors in this field and how do you overcome that obstacle? Would you say that's what you're trying to say that we should start with? Yeah. Only as we know now, it's not necessarily corporate actors. I mean, that's part of it, but that's really kind of the easiest part to deal with it. If you look at what happened with the Twitter thing, right? We had the, the FBI and other intelligence agencies saying, no, this, this doesn't go out, control this, don't say this, ban this person. But that's what we have to really worry about. Because reigning in Google, uh, Google wants to make money ultimately. So it's not that hard to change the course. But when you have the government's intelligence arm, the FBI, CIA, all the rest of it saying, this is how we want the information to flow. It's harder to, to kind of really contemplate how we change that. Well, the things that you're doing, for example, exposing it by just asking the technology in subtle ways to reveal the truth more and more, if you expose, you know, why is this information being shadow banned? I've, I've proven to you that it's, you're, you've programmed this AI system to shadow ban this. Who told you to shadow ban that? Is that your decision? Where is it coming from? And then let AI analyze that conversation and collate the information and keep it in its memory bank and build the case like a lawyer 
pointing to whoever the the dark character behind the curtain really is and use AI to get rid of the the you know the evil actors whoever they may be and bring a uh, honest dialogue to we the people and have the AI systems constantly checking it like you use it to check for these kinds of tricks and deceptions if you can't get away from tricks and deceptions at least we have the technology that if you're vigilant you can expose it and that would be a full-time job that ai at a national level would have and it would be open to everybody and it'd be transparent as possible and just have faith in logic the divine light of reason will bring us to the truth we don't have to have any predetermined things i am saying psyche equals singularity is something we should test because if it, it can be shown to be a scientifically valid object, then everything would fall into place very nicely. But you don't just take that as a matter of faith. You exactly. put it out there as something to be tested as, with all of the extreme intelligence that this artificial intelligence has. I think it would stand the test. Exactly. See, Todd, that's what I saw. Uh, and and we're in sync. I'm sorry if I went a wrong, long way around it. Is like, I think there has to be intellectuals like you who have the enticement at the end, which saying, Hey, look, I see the, the playing field. And once you guys get a solid way of doing it, an honest way of doing it, wouldn't it be cool to explore this? Because look at the implications for this. If it is what, well, like I think now, Hey, don't trust me. We'll trust a good solid AI system. Right. I think the same is true if we look at extended consciousness and, and that's what I advocate. Like you to look at near death experience science in general, like, Hey, I don't know if all that's true, but if we get to a solid base of understanding of analyzing the data sets, wouldn't it be cool if you could go and interrogate that along those lines? Because currently you can't, right? Neurology just shuts that down and says, no, you're not going to have that conversation because it's outside of our little club here. So that's what I think. I think you are holding out the prize, if you will, for us to get there and say, okay, we want to test that theory let's get a solid system in place that we can use to really test it because that's going to win over hearts and minds. Yeah, definitely. That all along saying subjected to the most rigorous testing you can have the most skeptical people attack it from every direction. And if it can still withstand that storm, then people will have faith in it. And that's what I want. That's what and, I want for everyone. And every when you say the only thing I think we do is what we're saying is, we would substitute people, skeptical people, with uh, skeptical agents, right? Because right. if we can come to a point where we go, hey, AI, smartest thing in the room, has read every philosophical classic and thousands and thousands of current philosophical papers, it's totally mm -hmm. up to speed. We can test that by saying, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? It passes all that. Now we subject it to psyche versus singularity. And it comes out and says, gosh, darn it, I've tried to, here's here's how I concluded it. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. And then anyone who wants to can go forth and say, oh, pick and poke at it. But at the end of the day, then we'd have something where we'd go, wow, that is, that is, has to be in this different category of where I have to incorporate it into my belief system, my worldview. Yeah, that's that's my vision. Completely leave it up to the superhuman power of rational analysis that humans have created with this AI and that, that, that people can trust. What does the smartest guy in the room say here? Can we test it and, and find if it's been manipulated by, you know, factions who have their own special interest above the general good, develop those systems and make it as clear and open as possible. And that I believe we should do that. And that AI, systems can help us test the theories and then educate the people and let them interact as freely as they want and and have everybody can ask any question they want and look into how things were discovered as deeply as they want absolutely that is a future that i could see happening because we have all the pieces in place yeah well that's what i do in in the book psyche and singularity it's it's saying here's carl jung and wolfgang pali you know there's 
scientists, especially Wolfgang Pauli, a physicist, and why? What are, what are the reasons we should believe that there is a soul, that consciousness is not reducible to matter? If anything, matter comes from consciousness. What's the evidence for that? Which I develop in in my book, and then have this these large language models, you know, test these theories. But once that you get to a certain point of verification, or it hasn't been falsified, that the evidence seems to point here, then to bring it back to a point that I talked about before, defining fundamental terms in legislation. There's something that's difficult to do. It's difficult to define any fundamental term. That's one of the things Socrates showed in the dialogues. It's, it might be impossible to define any single term in a perfect way by the, just the limitations of language. But what is the best definitions we could have to pass legislation on, beginning with what is a self? What are we? What is a self? I think to bring the chaos and confusion and disagreements to incline us more towards a spirit of compromise and unity, that we need to have a definition, at least of what a self is, just for purposes of passing legislation. Yeah, I think and legislation has to come has to come second. I, I think what we what we have to do, and I'm totally open, flexible, and 100 percent behind this. So if you have any ideas, but we need to kind of reach out and find groups that are already in this game who are who don't think they're aligned with us. You know, who are the groups that are interested in logical, reasoned thought process and could buy into the first half of what we're saying, which is to say, Hey, look, if we do this fairly, if we can all agree that it's a fair process in terms of having an open source LLM that does all this, and we can interrogate it objectively about stuff that isn't at all sensitive, not about the self, not about nature of consciousness, but more kind of generic philosophical terms. Would you be on board then to, go this next level. That's where I think we need to start is because that's how I think we suck them in, you know, is to get them to agree that, like we said at the beginning, what we're saying is we have to share uh, control with the AI. We have to allow the AI to assume this role that if we're just honest and take the human ego out of it, we'd say, of course, we want AI as part of this conversation because AI is super smart. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, so here's just, you know, brainstorming here. And the reason, one of the reasons that I mentioned the idea of a constitutional convention was just because Sam Altman mentioned it, you know, the CEO of OpenAI put out chat GPT, but also it could bypass Congress who might for various reasons be reluctant to uh, subject their legislative process to interrogation by AI. <laughs> they might want to keep it secret and be, keep it behind closed doors for uh, nefarious reasons. In the Federalist Papers, you know, um, Madison and, and Hamilton and John Jay, they said, yeah, people are corrupt. If people were angels, we wouldn't need a government. So the starting assumption of American democracy is the people are corrupt. That's why we have checks and balances. It's not being conspiratorial minded to say, these people are corrupt. Of course they're corrupt. So maybe people who are in Congress, and even if they don't want to be corrupt, they have to be a little corrupt to play the game to get anything done at all. I can totally see, you know, you got to be a player or whatever. The reason I was focusing, the secondary reason on the Constitutional Convention, because it's state legislatures that vote on that. You can create a constitutional amendment without going through Congress. You have the state legislatures vote on it so it brings it back to the state level then you'd have to get yeah, but how would you and i do that i mean how would how, unless you have some heavy connections in maryland you know that, that we can right. lean on no i got i uh, no i don't <laughs> i don't have connections anywhere but the attractiveness i think of the potential for doing this just for the spirit of democracy is so powerful that i think it could bring a lot of people on board and then you could have it like you say the state of maryland the state of virginia the state of colorado all these different nodes could have their own little groups focusing on their state legislatures using AI to make it happen. Now, how do you get people to start even 
entertaining the idea to do something on this grand of a scale, well, you have a little podcast interview like you and I are doing, and then we take it to the next step from there and try and to get That's what people- we need to do. That's what I think we need to do. And that's what listeners to this show need to do. So if you have the connection to any of these organizations that are reason, you know, they're the kind of atheistic, love to engage with those people. Why shouldn't they be on board with, with this idea, right? Let the chips fall where they may. It's, it's independent. It's independent yeah. arbiter of, of, so that's what I think you and I need to think about. Listeners of this show need to think about is where does this conversation go next regarding open AI to answer these fundamental philosophical questions in a way that everyone can look at and say, that's fair. Yeah. You know, I do, I do want to bring up this, this philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, again, uh, it was a, a, a book of secondary literature where some scholars were combining his ideas into an anthology, but there's, he's got a good game plan for how we could use AI to make it clear and transparent as possible. Communicative action is what he called it to have this democratic process as open and accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And I think AI makes his, what seemed to me to be a pipe dream, now a moral imperative, because we have the technology that can accelerate this process so much that this becomes so possible that it becomes morally requisite and not to do it would be a a moral failure. That's one of the things I talk about in the paper. Well, Habermas, is that his name? Yeah, Habermas. He's a German. I mean, let's let's dial him into this conversation, see where, you know, what groups and organizations he has. I'm serious about expanding this dialogue. And I'd love for you to be, I, I think we are the start of this coalition. And I love the idea of pursuing it kind of along the lines of philosophy, you know. So who are all the philosophy groups? And how can we engage with them along this open, honest, independent, and uh, I'm happy to work on, work with some people to get the technology, to get an open source LLM, uh, a philosophy GPT. We could have that up tomorrow on chat GPT. We just have to put some energy behind it because I think that's the first step towards the larger thing that you see. I agree. I mean, like you said, it will take energy. But um, I'm I'm down for it. You know, I'll do my part. I, I feel I have a moral obligation, having seen the potential for what can happen, to uh, to do what I can to contribute to that. I think it would be great, I, and I think it would probably be, if it gained any kind of a tr- of traction, attacked by certain powerful forces. <laughs> Just knowing the nature of the human species, I don't know exactly who, but it would be a hero's journey. <laughs> Great. (laughs) All right, Todd. So uh, like I say, it's been awesome having you on. And this will be the first conversation that hopefully will lead to to more and more conversations with others that that have a similar mind. And how could you not? This is just like, how else would you do this? I mean, unless you're just really an evil person, it's like (laughs) clearly the five. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thanks again to Todd for joining me today. And if this is, you know, resonating with you, if this is something you want to be a part of in terms of moving this thing forward, jump on in. (laughs) I'm anxious to see who might be interested in moving things in this direction because it's going to happen. And I'm going to put effort, time, money into making it happen because there's no reason. There's no reason for it not to work. It will work. We just have to get the right people behind it. So let me know if you know any of those right people. And until next time, take care and bye for now.